Okay, excuse me. I, sorry, I guess I <laughs> just am, am a poke sometimes. <laughs> but praise the Lord. I'm, I'm just, um, I'm excited about God and his word. I, I know there's just nothing else that feeds our soul. And uh, I just I just love those evenings when I can just look in the Bible and meditate on it and examine it and find the scriptures that come to mind and maybe discover some new ones. You know, there's many, 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 and um, it just goes on and on. But I, I just have felt led to um, give a study on the coming of the Lord, and I'm, I'm expecting it probably won't just be tonight that I'll be talking on this subject. There are so many verses. It's really something, and it's such a wonderful subject, but um, there's been a lot of confusion, of course, on that subject, and, and you know, I, I know for years many denominations didn't even preach the coming of the Lord, and from what I understand, there's some that did in former years preach the coming of the Lord like it was going to be now, and yet at this point, they don't seem to feel that urgency. And yet, we're way closer. I know when I was a young girl, I, I honestly, I, I heard many wonderful anointed messages. We were just blessed with a, a good church, and we had um, a lot of special speakers and, and missionaries from all over, and it was a lot of encouragement. It, it really fed the soul. But the theme often was the coming of the Lord, and I just, you know, I... I just grew up thinking the Lord was going to come, you know, any day, and, and surely that's the way it is. If I thought so then, it's, it's that much closer now, and we've just got to keep that in mind. It would be a trick of the devil to make you think that my Lord delayeth his coming, and I know that is what some have said and declared, that my Lord delayeth his, his coming, and the scripture says that the evil servant is the one that declares such. We can't put off that coming. It's at the door or the Lord knows when it will be, but, you know, certainly he will come, and we have to be expecting him. So praise the Lord. Praise God. Okay, it, it's, wow, it was just hard to even know how to organize this because, wow, there is a lot of material with his coming, and I know I, I feel that excitement, too. I, I just, we should be excited about the Lord coming. Amen. We've got to be looking for him and expecting him and, and um, know that it's going to happen. <laughs> His word says it will, and, and surely it will, and you know, it's going to come in somebody's lifetime, and, and it easily, easily could be ours, so praise the Lord. Well, to begin with here, I think I am going to take a, a look at um, some of the false things that have been misinterpreted in, in the scripture, and i um, going to explain just a little bit of the background here, so maybe we'll understand somewhat what happened, and, um, and maybe a little bit of the why. So anyway, um, I'm sure that the early believers, the, the apostles and, and those that followed those in the very first years after Jesus ascended were looking for the return of the Lord being imminent, being at the door, and, and, and they didn't know when. I, I'm sure they hoped it would be in their lifetime, you know, because that was their expectation. Some of them, of course, had witnessed Jesus on earth and had watched him even go up, and, and you know, can you imagine, you know, that promise of the two angels that told them that this same Jesus Jesus shall return in like manner, so come in like manner as you've seen him go up. And, and you know, that was very reassuring. And I, I'm sure that was the hope of their heart that uh, the Lord would return, that they would see him again because, you know, oh, wow, how wonderful to, to see the, our Lord again and, and um, uh, view him in person and, and be right there in his very presence. But praise the Lord. Um, so what happened is, well, he, he didn't come, you know, the first 100 years and second 100 years. And, you know, um, it seems like uh, the true doctrines of God's word began to get a little bit more distorted as time went on, certainly. And um, there were just a lot of false things going on. And, and um, we know that eventually the Roman Catholic Church kind of took over. And that was at, during a very dark time of history um, called the Dark Ages, really, when the... the the 
uh, uh, Holy Roman Empire, Empire was in force and, and uh, Catholicism ruled the day and um, you know, it, it wasn't a good time in many, many ways as I look back and into that time period. But thank the Lord, eventually the light did begin to show a little bit more. And um, in the 15th and 16th centuries, maybe around the time that Johannes Gutenberg came up with the printing press, we begin to have reformers that, that sprang up with insights from scripture that hadn't formerly been there. The, the printing press was a wonderful invention because suddenly it was way more possible to uh, come up with written materials and, you know, to multiply books and, and all that sort of thing. It didn't, they didn't have to be handwritten. And so um, what a difference. It was a wonderful invention and, and sh I'm sure it, it really helped even to proliferate the gospel. So what we had in the 15th and 16th centuries are reformers that came into the, into the picture and um, these were very zealous people that gained insight from God's word and, and just to name a, a few of them, we have John Huss and he was from Bohemia and um, he began to realize some things, the, the thing of indulgences was enforced there in the Roman Catholic institution which dominated the religious scene and he preached against it and eventually they didn't like it. <laughs> it, it. He did cause actually a lot of political uh, thought actually and there were some changes but eventually they turned against him and he was burned at the stake. So that was John Huss. And, and then there was another reformer, John Zingley, and uh, he came up with some good insights from God's word. He realized that salvation was by faith and not by works. And of course, that was really opposite of what the Catholic Church taught because, you know, here, you know, they were even, had, they had such things as indulgences, as I just mentioned, and, you know, buy these and, and you know, you could, maybe burn your way out of purgatory or you could pay for a sin that you even planned to commit or those that you had already committed. You just, you know, pay a fee and get a slip of paper and, you know, all would be well. So this was, of course, a very erroneous doctrine and um, Zingley is, is one of the individuals that begin to see through it and other things too he, he realized were wrong that um, were enforced there. He started started to um, observe the Lord's Supper instead of Mass, and I'm sure that was a really major thing, and he, he actually uh, caused quite a, a movement of Protestantism, a protest against the Roman Catholic Church, and, and some things that changed, some monasteries were closed, and also they began to abolish statues. So can you imagine? These were good gains spiritually. These were good insights that were gained uh, at this time of the Reformation. And of course we know there's Martin Luther and, and we're familiar with him and, and we know how he was a monk originally in, in the Catholic Church, but he, you know, it was his job to uh, be a scriptorian, so he studied the scriptures and, you know, he found by grace are you saved and not by works. And, and you know, that was a tremendous uh, inspiration to him, a tremendous realization. And um, he began to just uh, preach differently and, and teach differently. And also, of course, he, he came against indulgences also. Uh, and we know that it led to him putting his 95 thesis on the, on the um, door there, the church door at Wittenberg. And um, of course, that was quite a statement in, its, in itself. But he was bold and brave. And, and um, of course, you know, the Lord miraculously spared his life because uh, certainly they, they would have done away with him, but um, God made a provision so that he was able to stand and he, he was able to uh, even translate the Bible into the common language there, which would have been German. So praise the Lord, he, he did a, a true work for God. God gave him some definite revelations that were new at that point that hadn't been 
pointed out. And of course, that was the time when the scripture was so hard to find. You know, the Bible was, if they had one in a town, it was probably uh, on a pulpit of sorts. And, and it was chained. And the common people didn't have access to it. it. All they knew of the scripture was probably maybe from the paintings and drawings that were depicted on the walls or, you know, maybe what they felt. Of course, there were statues and all that sort of thing. And it was a completely false concept besides. And, you know, so it, it was really glorious when some of these lights on God's word began to show. And, and it's, these men were brave and, and stood up against the opposition. And God did preserve them in some cases and, and used them mightily even to call, cause even upheaval in, in their, uh, their lands, even politically. There were some tremendous changes that developed. And then we have John Calvin. And, and again, he had some new insights that people hadn't seen. Some of his insights are controversial. And, and you know, I, I can't say that everything that these men believed was right on, but the Lord was leading them. And, and another thing that struck him was the saved by grace. It was just a wonderful thing, a wonderful concept that hadn't fully been realized before. And of course, with him, there was the doctrine of election. And, um, you know, the Bible does teach a doctrine of election. I, I think he went to a, a extreme point in that case, and, and I, I think he went beyond what the Bible teaches in that respect. But anyway, the Lord was showing these men great things, and, and, and it caused this time of reformation, and, and Protestantism emerged, therefore, a protest against the Roman Catholic Church. And these reformers that I'm speaking of identified what they considered the false church then as the Lord began to realize, uh, re reveal it to them that the church was the Antichrist. So interesting, you know, this was, that was their insight. Well, the Catholic Church had to come up with a, a counter-reformation. So... Um, about that time in, into the 17th century more, uh, there were certain individuals that tried to do something to fight against the emerging Protestant movement that was coming about. And one man that I'm going to mention, his name is Francisco Roberta, I'm sorry, Ribera. And Ribera was a Je Jesuit priest. And um, he must have got out his pen and pencil and uh, decided to um, do a study on the book of Revelation and uh, ended up writing a commentary on the book of Revelation. Um, 1690 is when he completed that and um, he felt like the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel didn't apply to Christians. He, he thought that it focused on the seven years of tribulation is what he, he figured and um, so um, you know he was trying to uh, just lead in a different avenue, a, a, a different um, direction than formerly had been led, I believe. And so this was Ribera. And um, I don't know if they did a whole lot with his teachings at that point. It, it maybe uh, did have an impact to a certain extent, but it really wasn't until maybe the 19th century that um, his his uh, concepts, concepts were re-examined. And um, one individual who examined his concepts was a man named John Nelson Darby. And Darby was an Irish lawyer, and he turned to be a preacher, uh, an Anglican preacher. And um, you know, uh, he had some twists of his own. He, he uh, actually went back to Ribera's writings and um, I guess he must have liked them, and, and he uh, took them apart and, and he therefore came up with some biblical interpretations that were otherwise new at that point, the doctrine of dispensationalism and um, the rapture concept. This all came about because Ribera went back to or excuse me, uh, Darby went back to Ribera's teachings and examined them and then exp expounded on them. So this man Darby then, 
he became known as the father of the rapture doctrine. And um, he was in the 17th century. He lived um, throughout the 1800s. And um, you just wouldn't know what an impact this certain doctrine seemingly had because in this day and age, it's widely accepted and still being taught. And uh, basically what the rapture doctrine taught was that Jesus would return secretly that was considered his second coming. 